pick back up here with the endocrine emergencies and insulin and the cost of living with diabetes. So this information uh, has been updated from when we did this two years ago. Uh, to be totally honest with you, the numbers really didn't change all that much, which is, um, I guess, good and bad. Good in the fact that they didn't go up and bad in the fact that you'll see how much money we're actually spending on diabetic care. So the objectives here, we're going to hopefully understand differences in endocrine and exocrine glands, review some of the anatomy and physiology of the endocrine system, talk key differences in type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and that's really what I want to kind of focus on the most, identify how glucose and insulin affect the cells, look at key findings in hypo and hyperglycemia, some of the different medications used to treat diabetes, evaluate the differences in types and cost of insulin um, from rapid to intermediate to slow acting, and then identify the functions and management of insulin pumps. So endocrine versus exocrine glands. So endocrine glands are ductless and they secrete hormones directly into circulation. So basically it ends up getting into the bloodstream and they have a widespread effect. And that is what insulin is when we talk about an endocrine gland, obviously the pancreas, um, the islets of Langerhans that you learned at one point in time, and then the beta cells within that islet um, is what is responsible for creating your insulin. Insulin ends up into the bloodstream. It has a widespread effect and it acts on distant tissue, right? So it has many different targets and it is acting on distant tissue. When we're talking about an exocrine gland, exocrine glands actually have ducts. So I always, when I'm doing initial education or I'm doing tutoring, I always explain this to students and the fact, think about it as being like HVAC duct work that you would have in your house, right? So the furnace or the air conditioner kicks on and it blows either hot or cold air, depending on the time of year, which you have your thermostat set to, uh, that air goes through duct work and it delivers it to your kitchen or to your bedroom, et cetera. So same concept that we have internally with our body when we're talking about an exocrine gland. So exocrine glands, they have ducts and it delivers whatever that message is, right? Either air and HVAC uh, consideration, or it could be uh, saliva from the salivary gland um, would be an example of that. So, you know, saliva doesn't necessarily enter your bloodstream and have a widespread effect. It goes um, directly to the specific target to help to break down food, so on and so forth. So that's the difference between an endocrine and an exocrine gland. When we're talking about the endocrine glands, there's eight of them that we really talk about primarily. The hypothalamus, the pituitary, the thyroid, the parathyroids, the thymus, the pancreas, the adrenals, and then the gonads. And we're going to look at a couple of, of these um, a little bit more in depth, but not spend a ton of time on them because it's more about uh, the diabetic care that I really want to get into. So the hypothalamus deep within the cerebrum or the, the functional part of the brain, if you will. And it is responsible for linking the nervous and the endocrine system together. So it really has two different sides. It can have nerve cells and it can have gland cells uh, for the purpose of hormones. So the hypothalamus is really, really a, a key player in the regulating of body systems and what is going on in the body. And it's really an incredible um, portion of the 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 uh, system because it's only about the size of an almond, but as I said, it plays an enormous role in regulation of both nerve and gland cells, so it's very, very important in what it does. When we're talking hormones, and this would kind of go more for those of you that are in class or thinking about going to class, they're going to test you and ask you questions about the hormones, and the, the best um, thing that I can tell you is just read the names. So examples, and, and this sounds very simplistic or elementary, but if you just take the time to read the name, it'll probably tell you what that hormone is doing. So when you're reading your textbook and you start talking about growth hormone releasing hormone or growth hormone inhibiting hormone, you're probably overwhelmed when you read those titles. But if you just think about what those words are actually saying, growth hormone, so we're talking about a hormone that would cause you to grow releasing hormones. So if we have an excess of that, we're going to release too much growth hormone. And now all of a sudden we have individuals that are very big. We're talking about growth hormone inhibiting hormone. It is going to inhibit or block 
the release of growth hormones. So we may be talking about somebody that doesn't grow as effectively or they're not as tall, et cetera. So don't get overwhelmed by the names themselves. Just read the name and think about what the name is actually trying to tell you. And hopefully that will go a long way for those of you that are getting ready to certify or um, thinking about going to either EMT or paramedic class. The pituitary is uh, located on the bottom side of the hypothalamus. So we talked about the hypothalamus and where it's at. It's about the size of an almond located deep uh, within the cerebrum. The pituitary is at the bottom of that, and it's about the size of a pea. There's two different portions to the pituitary, and I've broken them here to the front and the back, the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. Um, from an EMS standpoint or pre-hospital care, we really kind of focus everything on the anterior pituitary because that's where all the hypothalamic hormones come from. When we are talking about the posterior pituitary, there's only a couple different things that come from the posterior pituitary. Um, ADH or antidiuretic hormone uh, comes from the posterior pituitary. Um, oxytocin comes from the posterior pituitary. Uh, but for the most part, that's really it from an EMS standpoint that we would uh, kind of think about. The other thing of note here is when we're talking about the anterior pituitary, I want you to think that it has more to do with hormones. And when we're talking about the posterior pituitary, it really has more to do with nerve impulses. So remember, um, it's getting the information and then disseminating the information to where it needs to go. This has a direct impact on the endocrine gland throughout the body. So it's kind of the gatekeeper, if you will. It's going to tell the gates that they either need to open up or they need to close, depending on the hormones or the nerve impulses that you're trying to either send or receive to the various target tissues. So the anterior pituitary, it is responsible for adrenocorticotropic hormone, which is coming from the adrenal cortex. These are your steroids, okay? So the, the adrenals, if you can remember back to your basic anatomy, we have two kidneys, two paired kidneys, if you will, that sit kind of in the retroperitoneal area. And on top of the kidneys, you have a diamond-shaped, sorry, a triangle-shaped um, organ that is known as the adrenal glands. And inside the adrenal glands, there's really two different portions. You have the adrenal cortex and you have the adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla is the inside portion of the adrenal gland and the adrenal cortex is the outside portion. So when we are talking about the adrenal cortex and we're talking about adrenocorticotropic hormone, we are referring to steroids. That is, what is where your steroids are coming from. Um, so if we have somebody that has an adrenal tumor and they have an overproduction of adrenocorticotropic hormone, what you are going to see in that individual is obsessive weight gain. They're going to end up having too much of the steroid, and we'll talk about what that looks like potentially. And remember, going back to initial education or tutoring, I always tell the students, nobody picks up the, the phone and calls 911 and says, hey, my adrenal cortex is functioning perfectly. They pick up the phone and call because there's either an overproduction or an underproduction. Now, they don't know what that is most of the time. They just know that, hey, I've got this weight gain. I feel like crap. I'm, you know, I'm lethargic. I don't have any energy or I'm losing a ton of weight. I'm bouncing off the walls. So they know what the symptoms are. We need to be able to kind of put the, those pieces of the puzzle together. The anterior pituitary is also responsible for TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone, which comes directly from the thyroid. FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, which is gonads or the sex organs. Luteinizing hormones, which comes from the gonads and then prolactin. And this is the mammary glands of women. On the posterior aspect or the backside of it, as I told you, antidiuretic hormone or ADH also known as arginine vasopressin, and this is what is responsible for a retention of body water. So again, these words, you know, big words, but antidiuretic. So when we diurese, we are peeing, right? We are voiding water. If we are anti-doing that, we are anti-peeing, well, that means you are holding on or retaining body water, and we would want to do that in cases of trauma. So we hope that if we are traumatized, we hold on to fluid. That's what it keeps our blood pressure up to allow us to have good cardiac output. But in the event 
that maybe we have had alcohol in our system prior to our traumatic event, alcohol eliminates the ability for antidiuretic hormone to be released, which is also known as breaking the seal. So from an alcohol standpoint, once you go and you urinate after you've started consuming alcohol and you've, in air quotes, broken the seal, that is because the alcohol prevents antidiuretic hormone from being released, which is why you have excessive urination and then you are dehydrated the next day. Oxytocin, as we know, are responsible for uterine contraction and lactation. And then diabetes insipidus, um, that is totally different than diabetes mellitus, which is what we're kind of focusing on for the purpose of this lecture. Diabetes insipidus um, has to do with inadequate antidiuretic hormone secretion. So the patient has constant urination. And just to kind of put this in perspective for you, a normal person voids anywhere from, it, it's 0.5 to 1 cc per kilo per hour. So we'll just say that the patient weighs the 70 kilos that they claim that everybody weighs, right? And we'll do the one just to make it easy. You should be peeing about 70 cc's of, of fluid or for, of water per hour. That is what you should be voiding somewhere in that general vicinity. Patients that have um, inadequate ADH or a condition like diabetes insipidus, they can void 10 liters a day. It is an incredible amount. So they are extremely dehydrated and it is because they don't have the ability to regulate their antidiuretic hormone. So very interesting, but it is a completely different mechanism than what diabetes mellitus is. When we're talking about the thyroid, remember the thyroid, there's two different lobes. This is what the thyroid looks like. It sits kind of directly in the center of your neck, directly below the thyroid cartilage or your Adam's apple. And these are the two different lobes, right? So it's located in the anterior neck and it produces three different hormones, thyroxine, which is T4, triiodothyronine, which is T3, and then calcitonin. So if you are a remembering type person, just remember tri is three. So triiodothyronine is T3, T4 is your thyroxine. But what I wanna kind of point out to you here is what your thyroid really is doing, right? It does the thyroid hormone, sure. But calcitonin, so it lowers the blood calcium levels, and it does this because it causes calcium reuptake by the bones and inhibits breakdown of bone tissue. So your thyroid, I'm going to kind of clean this up and hopefully make this easy. Your thyroid takes calcium from your blood, and it puts it into your bone, and that is what makes your bones strong. So again, kind of thinking downstream, if you have somebody that has had a thyroid issue, they've had a thyroidectomy, they have thyroid cancer, those types of things, they have to start looking or watching the blood calcium levels because of that. Because if you have some kind of a tumor, you have an issue where your thyroid has been removed, now all of a sudden you may not have the ability to regulate the blood calcium levels. So I want you to think about this for a second. I have calcium in my blood. I am pulling the calcium from my blood and putting it in my bone. The problem is, how do we get that calcium from the bone back into the blood if we need to do that? And the answer is your parathyroids. So we have para, para means around. So we have four parathyroids and they kind of sit in each of the various quadrants of the thyroid itself. So there are four small glands on the posterior and lateral surfaces of the thyroid. So this is the back portion of the thyroid, and it's on the lateral surface as well. And they secrete what is known as parathyroid hormone. And what parathyroid hormone does is it increases the blood calcium levels. So it is an antagonist of calcitonin. So calcitonin takes it from the blood, puts it into the bone. And then your parathyroid hormone takes it from the bone and puts it back into the blood. And that is the check and balance system that has to be um, monitored, as I said, in the event that you have someone that has had an issue previously with their thyroid, or maybe this ends up leading to some of the diagnostics of a patient that has calcium levels that are kind of going astray. So you go in, you have your normal annual physical, and your calcium levels are off the chart, or they are low, 
it may be something that they start looking at your thyroid and your parathyroid right away to make sure that they're not missing something causing your calcium levels to fluctuate the way that they are. With your thymus, not a big deal. Um, it's in the mediastinum just behind the sternum, but it goes away after childhood. So it is responsible during childhood to release what is called thymosin. And this is where we end up getting those T lymphocytes. And remember, the, C, the T lymphocytes are what we use for cell-mediated immunity. We have humoral immunity and you have cell-mediated immunity. But remember, we have those helper T cells, right? Do you remember that from EMT or paramedic school? Those helper T, that T is coming from the thymosin from the thymus. And that is why they are called T cells, um, but it disappears after childhood. And if you think about this from a common sense perspective, what happens is when you are in utero and you start developing some immunity, and then after you are born, you start developing more immunity, and then you get sent to preschool where everybody has a snotty nose and they're ill, and your body helps to build up that defense mechanism. And now all of a sudden we have all the cell-mediated immunity um, in, in ways that we can combat bacteria and infections, et cetera, on the internal aspect. So the thymus basically disappears in adulthood. If you were to shoot a chest film on an adult, you're not going to find the thymus, but on a chest x-ray in a pediatric patient, depending on their age, uh, you probably would still be able to see the thymus. So it's kind of interesting why it's there and that it does end up going away. With regards to the pancreas, we know that the pancreas is located in the left upper quadrant, unless we're dealing with dextrocardia, in the retroperitoneal area behind the stomach, and it has both those endocrine and exocrine tissues. So what do we mean by that? It, what I mean is some portions of the pancreas have a widespread effect, and they do not have ducts, and other parts of it are a duct system and it delivers the the information that it needs to directly to the area that it is trying to fix. The endocrine tissues come from that islets of Langerhans. Our alpha cells are what are responsible for glucagon to help raise blood sugar and the beta cells help to lower the blood sugar and this is where insulin comes from. The exocrine tissues secrete digestive enzymes directly to help break down food so that we can have proper breakdown peristalsis and then voiding of food. So homeostasis, how does our body do it? So it does it through two different ways, glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. And again, if I'm talking to people in particular that are new into this or in class or thinking about going to class, I cannot stress this enough. If you were to find me, you know, in a meeting or, you know, somewhere on the street and ask me what my biggest recommendation is or what I think is one of the biggest pitfalls in EMS education, it is medical terminology. Because if you understand how to break these words down, it makes it so much easier to understand what is going on. So we'll look at glycogenolysis. Glyco is sugar. Gen is formation. So anytime we're talking about genesis, we're talking about a formation. And anytime we use the word lice, we are talking about the breakdown. So when we're talking about glycogenolysis, we are getting a glucagon stimulates the breakdown of glycogen. So we're getting a new type of sugar because we are breaking down glycogen, right? So glucagon stimulates the breakdown of glycogen into glucose. Glycogen is a complex system. Our body cannot utilize it. It will store it as glycogen, but we can't use it. We have to break that down into glucose in order to be able to use it. If we are looking at the word gluconeogenesis, same thing. Gluco is sugar. Neo means new. And genesis is formation. So we're talking about a new sugar formation, and that is where we get new glucose from non-sugar sources. The example here, and this will probably resonate with some of you, or you'll at least know what I'm talking about, is individuals that are on either an Adkins or a low-carb diet, right? They don't take carbs in because carbs are what end up breaking down into glucose, and then we have sugar because of it. If you are on a no-carb diet, we don't have sugar sources coming in in the form of carbs, your body will switch over to something else to burn. And what it does is it switches over mostly to fat 
and we end up in what is called ketosis. So we are getting new glucose from a non-sugar source. We have to have energy, and that's how we do it, is through gluconeogenesis. Both of these are going to contribute to homeostasis, which ends up raising blood glucose levels. The adrenal glands, I told you where they were. We have the outside portion or the adrenal cortex, and we have the adrenal medulla, which is the inner portion. The outside portion or the cortex is all of your steroids, your glucocorticoids, your mineral corticoids, and then your androgenic hormones. So all of these are housed and affected by the adrenal cortex, and these are what help to raise our blood sugars, right, our glucocorticoids, which is why if you are a diabetic or you have a family member that is a diabetic, they are always very hesitant to put diabetic patients on any type of steroid therapy because we know that their sugars are going to spike and it is not good for them for that to happen. With regards to the adrenal medulla, it's catecholamine. So this is your epinephrine and norepinephrine. That is where it is going to be secreted from. So again, if you have a tumor on the adrenal medulla, then you may end up having an overproduction or an underproduction of either epinephrine or norepinephrine. And that is what is happening in the adrenals. You can kind of see here, as I said, they're kind of um, uh, triangle shaped and they sit atop each one of the paired kidneys. The pineal is located in the thalamus in the brain. It releases melatonin in response to changes in light. And we know that melatonin may affect mood. So how do they work? Well, they either build up or they break down. And this is what is known as anabolism versus catabolism. So anabolism or anabolic helps to build up and use energy the way that I've always remembered that is your anabolic steroid use. So if you have anabolic steroids, it is helping to build up muscle and it uses energy for that to happen. If we're talking about catabolism, that is the breakdown of something. So maybe we give a medication to help catabolize um, something that is going on in the body, right? Like if we had an overdose type situation, we may give a catabolic um, antidote to that to where they start to break down things. And when we're talking catabolism, it does not require any energy. All right, so let's take a look at diabetes. So the annual financial impact in the United States is $327 billion. That is a significant amount of money. Um, I actually changed this slide and then went back and researched it. And it was, there, there are two different numbers, 237 billion and then $327 billion. But according to the CDC, annually in the United States, we spend $327 billion on diabetic related care and issues, um, once again, in the United States alone. So a, a tremendous amount of money. So for one of every $4 spent in the United States for health care is related to diabetic care. $237 billion is spent on medical cost, which is why I had to change that number because I kind of got confused on what I was reading. So it's actually $327 billion total, but $237 is medical cost alone, and then another $90 billion is in lost productivity. From 2007 up to 2022, it has been a 60% increase. It continues to go up. We are not getting ahead of the situation. We're going to continue to have problems if we do not get ahead, get, um, ahead of it. 61% of diabetic costs are for those 65 and older, um, and these are paid mainly by Medicare. So you think, oh, okay, well, at least it's not a hit on our insurance plan. Well, at the end of the day, we're still paying taxes for Medicare and Medicaid, so we are paying for it nonetheless. 48 to 64% of lifetime costs for a person with diabetes for complications related to diabetes, such as heart disease and stroke. And then as far as the average annual expenditures, the individual, okay, not the insurance, the individual that is diagnosed with diabetes and has to have managed care um, so these are not patients newly diagnosed and everything is under control. These are patients that have had like long-term effects. Maybe they've had heart disease and stroke. It's over $16,000 annually in expenditures and over $9,000 of that is directly related to the diabetic uh, condition that they are suffering from. So are we on the right path to slow the disease process? The simple answer is no. So about one in 10 
um, have diabetes in the United States. One in three have pre-diabetes, so we're on the path of getting diabetic. Um, and the way that they do that is through the hemoglobin A1C. So hopefully if you have an annual physical every year, you can have an H uh, A1C drawn. The reason that that hemoglobin A1C works and gives you the information that you're looking for is with hemoglobin, the hemoglobin basically kind of die off and they get replaced every 90 days. So what happens when we're looking at a hemoglobin A1C is the sugar will attach to that hemoglobin and we can tell based on a mathematical calculation in a lab what the sugar has been on average over that 90 day period. And that is why when they say, well, we'll look at a hemoglobin A1C and it tells us what your sugars have been over the last 90 days, that's why. That's because that's how long a hemoglobin actually will live. So about 20% of adolescents age 12 to 18 and about 25% of adults 19 to 34 have prediabetes. It is more prevalent in Asians, non-Hispanic Blacks, Hispanics than in non-Hispanic Whites. And diabetic mellitus or diabetes mellitus, what is it? So we talked about diabetes insipidus, but I wanna make sure that everybody understands what diabetes mellitus is and how we would know that. So diabetes mellitus is to pass through, that's what diabetes is, and mellitus is sweetened with honey. Those are the, the Latin meanings of what that is, and most of the medical education comes from the Latin root when we start talking about the terminology. So diabetic uh, mellitus has been around for centuries and traces back to the early Egyptians, so back in the day, and I left these in here, this was in two years ago when I did it, but it's kind of interesting. Back in the 1800s, they would have dogs um, that were noted to be drawn to the urine of some individuals. And what they ended up finding is that the dogs were actually drawn to those individuals because they could sense that the urine was sweet. So upon further investigation, it was revealed that the urine was sweet tasting and the dogs were drawn to that sweet sense of the urine. So that is how um, they have kind of come around with the diabetic dogs and being able to tell what people's blood sugars are based on um, a canine. So it has inadequate insulin activity. And the next slide will kind of look at how this actually relates type one versus type two. So we'll just kind of jump there. With type one, so here's the difference between your type one and your type two diabetic. With type one, we, we all know or should hopefully um, that the islets of Langerhans and the pancreas has alpha and beta cells. The beta cells release insulin. In a type one diabetic, you do not have that ability. It is an actual problem in the pancreas with the beta cells. You are not releasing the amount of insulin that you should or you're not releasing any insulin at all. So the treatment here is insulin. We have to have insulin. And if our body is not either A, producing it, or it's producing too little, then we have to take insulin as a supplement in order to make that work. So it was previously known as juvenile onset just because it was diagnosed at an early age. Um, an insulin-dependent diabetic mellitus, or IDDM, requires insulin for homeostasis. That is what is going on with your type 1 diabetic. It is still frequently diagnosed in early childhood, but most of the time that's because of a symptom that mom or dad or a caregiver says is going on with the child. So, you know, they're either urinating all the time or they, they are constantly eating, so there's something going on. Maybe it's a weight gain issue. And then they start diving in and figuring out what is going on with the patient. And they determine that they are in fact a type one diabetic. All goes back to not having enough insulin produced or not having any insulin produced. When we are talking about a type two diabetic, this has nothing to do with the pancreas. Your pancreas is functioning totally fine. The problem in a type two diabetic is the insulin resistance. So if you can think about what insulin is trying to do, it's trying to penetrate through the tissues and get to its target cells to break down sugar, right? Well, if you have a bunch of excess adipose tissue, i.e. fat tissue, it is harder for the insulin to get from point A to point B. So we call this insulin resistance. The insulin is there. It just can't get where it needs to get. 
It was previously known as adult onset. These are your non-insulin dependent diabetics, although some patients may require insulin. So don't let insulin just totally be, be your deal breaker for type one versus type two. You really have to kind of ask the patient, you know, are you a type one or are you a type two? Is it an, a, an issue with your pancreas or is it an issue with insulin resistance? When were you diagnosed? Those types of things. But remember, type 2 is not an insulin problem. It's a problem with getting insulin where it needs to go. So type 1 is far uh, less common than what type 2 is, but it is a more serious condition, and it does account for more uh, diabetic-related deaths. And hereditary factors are very important, and they do play a significant role. If left untreated, type 1 diabetics, their blood glucose levels are going to rise, because the cells, due to the lack of insulin, can't take up the circulating sugar. So we have sugar in our body. We should have insulin that kind of goes in and gobbles it up, keeps our sugar at check. If we don't have insulin to do that, then the blood sugar continues to rise. With type 1 diabetics, what you're going to find is a blood glucose level of somewhere around three to 500 or not all, at all uncommon. And they're going to have the, the P's, right? The polydipsia, the polyuria, and the polyphagia. And that is because the constant thirst, the polydipsia, that is because they have constant urination. Your body is only able to retain glucose up to about 130 milligram per deciliter. After that 130, it starts to spill over. And remember, kind of like sodium, where sodium goes, water follows, because the sugar molecule is big, it is going to have an osmotic uh, diuretic uh, cause to that. So because that sugar is spilling over, you're going to end up having water follow it. So that is why they get um, the constant thirst because they are peeing out. That is where the polyuria comes in, excessive urination. And they're going to have a ravenous appetite or polyphagia because they have to eat. So they're trying to take things in. And at the same time, they're having excess voiding. Ketosis will result from a, a, a fat catabolism or breakdown in type 1 diabetics will end up leading to diabetic ketoacidosis if it is not treated. Your type 2 hereditary uh, risk factors and obesity play a far more, uh, far more significant role in type 2. It is more common than type 1 diabetics, and it accounts for about 80% of diabetes mellitus. If untreated, uh, type 2 diabetics present with lower levels of normal hyperglycemia and fewer major signs of metabolic disruption. But what ends up happening here on type 2, if we look at the right side of the screen, it ends up leading to what is called HNK or HHNK, and that is hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar, non-ketotic. Um, it used to be HHNKA um, acidosis, so they will become acidotic in this situation as well. The cells are resistant, so the blood glucose levels continue to rise because, as we already talked about, you can't get the insulin to the target tissue to start breaking down the sugar. They will end up with a severe dehydration because of that osmotic diuresis that we talked about. Their blood sugars are going to be much higher than that of a DKA patient. So it is not uncommon, and you're probably not going to know this in the field because our monitors or our um, one-touch machines, uh, they're going to tell you high after about 600. It'll just say high. So you're truly not going to know unless you have the history of type 1 versus type 2 and what the onset has been. But once they get them to the lab, they will give that information back, and it will come back as a critical lab value. The highest one that I've ever seen personally is 1,300. I'm sure there are cases or situations where the blood sugar was higher than that. Uh, but it was an individual that I had that did have a type 2 and was suffering from HINC and had a blood sugar of over 1,300. Type 2 and HINC carries a higher mortality, 40 versus 70 percent. With both of these, type 1 and type 2, and DKA and HHNK, the treatment in the pre-hospital setting is to administer fluids. It's really the only thing that we're able to do in the field. They need to obviously get the sugar level down, and they're going to do that um, in the emergency department or in the hospital setting. But from a pre-hospital standpoint, start a line and start dumping fluids into the individual because they are severely dehydrated as part of what their problem is.
So what can we do to help? Well, insulin. So insulin was originally extracted in 1925 from the pancreas of both beef and pork. Um, and they use that for a long period of time until the 1980s when human insulin was made synthetically. So it's basically man or made in a lab, right? Synthetic, um, therefore replacing the need for the beef and pork insulin. So now we get all of it basically from a lab type situation. There are different types of insulin. There's fast acting, intermediate acting, and long acting. And I know that we don't carry insulin, but I do think that people should be somewhat educated so that when you go and you're talking to a patient that has um, diabetes and they're on insulin, you can at least have a conversation with them. Um, so a question from company two, where does bicarb come into play with these conditions as administration based on lab results on how much bicarb the hospital gives? Yeah, so with the acidosis, obviously, if we can, so giving them bicarb is going to help to fix symptoms but it doesn't necessarily get to the root of the problem. If we can get to the root of the problem by dropping their sugar, by giving them insulin, in, in, for example, um, then we are gonna get rid of the symptoms as well. I can't tell you for sure exactly what the ratio is of bicarb, but yes, it would be based on the lab um, and what those lab findings are and how acidotic they are. And they, they have other labs that they can obviously draw to look at acidosis. They can draw a lactate level so they can figure out what some of the, um, the acidity is and then base the bicarb administration on what some of those lab findings are. But as I told you, I, I can't remember, nor do I know if I ever even knew uh, truly what the ratio is on how much bicarb you would give. My gut instinct, and I know this is probably not the right approach, is they would like start with a half an amp of bicarb and titrate to the effect. Um, the, the true bicarb dose is one milli equivalent for, per kilo. Um, so if you're basing it on body weight, it would be a milli equivalent per kilo. And that's in basically everything with like rhabdo or patients that are um, found down for a long period of time if we're giving that in cardiac arrest. So it would probably be somewhere around a milli equivalent per kilo, but I don't know what the true ratio is based on lab work. Hopefully that answers the question. All right. So with Fast acting insulin, it, it absorbs very rapidly from the fatty tissue in the bloodstream. So the reason that I wanted to put this in here and kind of go through it with you all is when, you know, you make your call for a diabetic today and you ask them, you know, do you take any type of medicine? Yeah, I'm on insulin. Uh, you know, I'm on a fast acting and intermediate acting or a long acting. You'll at least have some ability to, to be able to talk with them, um, intelligently based on the information, hopefully, that we're going to cover here in the next few minutes. So with your fast-acting insulin, it absorbs very rapidly from the fatty tissue in the bloodstream, and it is mainly used to control sugar during meals and snacking. So this is a situation, you know, you have a diabetic and they are getting ready to eat something that maybe they know they should not eat. They're going to take their fast-acting insulin because it's going to correlate with the high blood sugar levels. They get ready to eat whatever it is that they're eating, maybe carbs, they're having Italian. They eat the, uh, the meal, they take their fast acting insulin, and hopefully it helps to kind of regulate that pretty quickly. There are a bunch of different ones out there, but Aspar, Lispro, glu uh, Glulacine is another one. The onset here, five to 15 minutes, so it comes on very quickly but it'll only last for about four to six hours. So they can't take it once a day and then be done. But, you know, most of the time what you'll see is if you know somebody that's a diabetic, when they sit down to eat lunch or dinner, they may check their sugar and then give themselves some fast acting insulin because they know within the next 10 to 15 minutes, um, the insulin is going to start working and hopefully the meal is going to be there pretty quick. Otherwise, we run the risk of taking insulin and not eating. And then we have a hypoglycemia situation, which I'm sure you all um, sometimes respond to. The long acting, it is absorbed very slowly and it causes a plateauing effect. And this will help to last throughout the day, right? So it is also used to control blood sugar at night while fasting and in between meals. Examples here, glar, uh, Glargine and Detamir, it takes a little bit longer for these insulins to onset, as you can see there, an hour and a half to two hours, but some of these can last up to 24 hours, and it does give that plateauing effect, so it's thought 
that if you have diabetic patients that are well-controlled, some of these medications are a lot better because they don't have those, those uh, peaks and troughs or the, the uh, peaks and valleys, if you will, um, the ups and downs with their sugar. They can kind of keep them into more of a plateauing effect, and some of those medications will allow them to do that. So what about the cost? So insulin cost back in 1996, the average was $21 a month. Um, these numbers, and, and this is from the AGM, or AJMC, so the American Journal of Medical Care, if I can remember, and it's in the reference at the very end. Um, but these numbers are, are out of control, and it basically goes back to the pharmaceutical companies making a lot of money. So insulin cost of $96, $21 a month. By 2001, so not too long after 1996, the same insulin from the same manufacturer rose to $35 a month. Honestly, not that big of an uptick. I don't have a ton of problem with that. In 2019, that $21 a month had increased by 1,200% to $275 a month. This is only one example. Many other manufacturers had folks paying more than $1,000 a month for their medication. If you remember back a couple of years, and I truly do not remember if it was um, a Democratic or Republican president, it really doesn't matter as long as they get the cost under control for the people that need the insulin. But it's been a couple of years back. One of the presidents actually kind of helped to enact federal legislation that helped to bring some of these medication costs down with regards to insulin. And it's interesting because I've done live continuing education courses and people in that class have told me, yeah, you know, I have a daughter or I have a wife that is an insulin dependent diabetic. And like, we were really struggling until these laws were enacted to basically bring the cost of the insulin down. So it does help people, normal everyday people, regardless of your political viewpoint. Um, we shouldn't have to pay 1200% increases in our medication cost over a short period of time. So what did they do? Well, they ended up capping the medication costs. So they looked um, at making insulin more affordable and accessible and ended up capping cost of insulin in the following state. And Colorado is kind of bolded in, in, in bigger uh, font because they truly led the way. It all came from Colorado and then many others kind of followed suit. So Illinois, Maine, New York, Utah, Washington, West Virginia, now basically they all are. So the cost of insulin in those states was not able to exceed $100 a month um, and then other states have actually taken that even further. New Mexico used to be in that $100 a month camp, um, but they've since changed. So now Connecticut, New Mexico, Texas, as examples, the cost of insulin in those states cannot exceed $25 a month. So they are trying to make it much more affordable for the individuals that need it, and that is really good. So hypoglycemia, we should know. Uh, low blood sugar levels, and we're going to treat that with oral sugar, oral glucose, or IV dextrose. Uh, and you may consider IM glucagon if your IV is unsuccessful. Remember that with glucagon, it's the same thing as what is going on with the alpha cell in the islets of Langerhans. We have um, glucagon in our body. It's stored in the liver. So when you give that milligram of glucagon and as an injection, you mix it with your sterile water, you draw it up, it's reconstituted, you draw it up and you give it as an IM injection, it goes in and it hits the liver to release the uh, glucagon that is stored there. And that's what takes time. We take the glucagon, it affects the liver and it causes gluconeogenesis. So it starts to break down the sugar storages, that glycogen that is stored in the liver into a simpler form, i.e. glucose. And once we have glucose, now we have the ability to utilize that because it is a simple sugar. So if you're giving glucagon, that's fine, but just realize it's gonna take 25, 30 minutes for the glucagon to do what it needs to do because it actually is going to the liver and helping to break things down there. It would be much simpler, much quicker to simply give oral sugar, as long as they're not gonna choke and aspirate, oral glucose, same thing, or you can think about giving IV dextrose. And it used to always be D50. I think most people now are doing D25 or even D10, and that is totally acceptable. All right, so managing insulin pumps. So there are a bunch of different variations of insulin pumps that are out there. Um, EMS familiar, familiarity, um, with each device may prove difficult because there's so many different ones. So first and foremost, what I would recommend, 
talk to the family, talk to the caregivers and see if they can give you any insight and don't feel dumb doing that. If I make a run today on a diabetic patient and I walk in and they have a pump and mom or dad's standing there, I can assure you the first thing that I'm going to do is, hey, can you educate me on this pump? What do I need to know? But that comes with experience, right? And being comfortable. When you're new, you feel like you should know everything about EMS. So you're a little bit more hesitant or shy about asking some of those questions that at the end of the day would make things a lot easier for you. So don't be hesitant. The parents or the caregivers would much rather you ask if you're not sure than mess something up. So just ask them, hey, I'm not familiar with this particular device. Can you kind of help me here? What do I need to know? Can we disconnect it, um, et cetera, et cetera, depending on what the situation with the patient is. So it may be the best practice to remove the needle insertion point at the skin. If you do that, that is a sharp and it should be protected as a sharp, right? So put into a sharps container. Um, if the choice to stop the pump is made, you can simply stop or clamp the pump to eliminate the pump's ability to continue to deliver insulin. And most of the time, this is going to just be a simple clamp, right? You can look at it and figure it out in two seconds. When would we do that? Well, if they're hypoglycemic, their sugar is down and the pump is still obviously doing what it's supposed to do, it's going to continue to deliver insulin and it's going to further reduce the sugar level that the patient has. That would not be a good thing. So we need to either turn it off or we need to have the ability to, to clamp it um, or remove the needle, whichever one is most effective for you. If you have the caregiver around, again, consult with them and figure out what's the best approach for them um, or have them do it for you. Other considerations with endocrinology, um, your thyroid disorders, hyperthyroidism. What hyperthyroidism is, is an excess of thyroid hormone in the blood. So remember, we had the T3 and T4 thyroxine and triadothyronine and all those things, right? So what we're talking about here is we have too much thyroid hormone in the blood, and that will end up leading to what is known as Graves' disease. If Graves' disease is not treated or is not caught and managed early enough, that will end up leading to a condition called thyroid toxicosis, or you may have heard it called thyroid storm. That is a prolonged exposure to excess thyroid hormones, and it is caused by the Graves disease. So hyperthyroidism leads to Graves. Graves leads to thyroid toxicosis. And on the opposite side of that, we have hypothyroidism. So that is an inadequate amount of thyroid hormone in the blood. So we don't have enough circulating around. And if we don't have enough, hypothyroidism leads to what is known as myxedema or myxedema coma, and that is a result of a long-term exposure to inadequate levels of thyroid hormones. So remember, anytime you're looking at endocrinology in particular, there's always an up and always a down. And if you can remember one side of it, then you can extrapolate the information for the other side. You don't really have to remember both. Just remember what one does and then know, okay, obviously, then if it's too low, it's going to cause the opposite. And when I tutor, I always just use um, sugar with diabetes. I, I have patient or students tell me, what does hypoglycemia look like, low blood sugar? And most people know, oh, well, they're going to be pale. They're going to be cool. They're going to be diaphoretic. They're going to be lethargic. Okay. Well, what does high blood sugar cause then? And it should be the opposite of pale, cool, and diaphoretic. And it is. It's hot, dry, pink skin, right? Or red skin. So if you can think like that, it will make managing some of these endocrine issues much easier for you as you go through your training. All right. So Graves' disease, remember, this is too much, right? So it's six times more common in women than men. It often occurs in young adulthood. It's from an autoimmune origin. Um, excessive amounts of thyroid hormone get released into the bloodstream. And if that does not get caught or treated appropriately, it will end up leading into this thyroid storm. Thyroid storm can be a life-threatening emergency. It's fatal within 48 hours if it is untreated. So as I told you, people probably aren't calling you and saying, hey, I'm getting ready to go into thyroid storm. Maybe they do because they've had it. 
but it's going to be the other signs and symptoms. They've got a high fever, they're irritable, delirious, tachycardic, those types of things. So they call because they feel bad. And then it's up to us or the hospital ultimately to recognize what is going on with these patients. When we're looking at Graves versus Mixedema, remember Graves is too much, Mixedema is too little. So Graves is going to cause that agitation, insomnia, or heat tolerance. They have weight loss. These people are bouncing off the walls, okay? They have too much thyroid hormone. If you look at the patient with Mixedema or Mixedema coma, everything is slowed down. They have hypothermia, stupor estate, they're lethargic, cold intolerance, they're not able to have BM, so they have constipation. So one is too much, the other is too little. One is going to cause an increase in everything, tachycardia, all of these things. The other is going to cause a reduction in all of those things, i.e. bradycardia. So learn to read and kind of figure these things out as you compare them to one another. Same thing with the adrenal. Cushing's versus Addison's. So Cushing's is too much of the steroid. Addison's is too little. And the way that we always remember that, or I teach that, is the way that we fix Addison's is you add a soon. And that is actually the reason why you guys carry Solumedrol in your protocol. I think most of you would probably say that you're carrying Solumedrol based on the fact that um, you have patients with respiratory difficulty and you give that as part of like asthma or COPD exacerbation. The reality is when K-beams uh, required us to start carrying uh, corticosteroids, it was because of Addisonian's crisis that it was actually put into the mandated protocol. So Addison, add a soon. What is uh, solumedrol? Methylprednisolone. So we're adding a soon. If you can remember that, then you'll remember that Addison's is a deficient, which is why we have to add it, okay? Um, if we're talking about Cushing's, it's just simply too much. All right, so Cushing's, this is Cushman here, the moon face buffalo hump. This is kind of what they look like uh, when they are suffering from Cushing syndrome. Addison's hyperpigmentation of the skin and mucous membrane, uh, electrolyte imbalances, cardiac arrhythmia. So the situation here, and actually we're kind of in the time period of when this happens, you have females that are getting ready to go to prom. They are on long-term steroid use because they have asthma. They want to look pretty in their, their wedding or their prom dress or whatever that situation may be. So they suddenly quit taking their steroids and it puts them into an Addisonian's crisis. Um, and, and those are kind of the historical uh, findings that you would find with somebody that has an Addisonian's. And this is also goes back, if you've ever taken any type of steroid therapy, why you should always taper steroids. If you've ever had a Medrol dose pack, you take their four milligram tabs and you take six in day one, then five, then four, three, two, and one. And the reason that we do that is you should always taper your steroids because if you don't, you run the risk of putting yourself into Addison's uh, crisis um, and then having to deal with what we're talking about here.